What's up, everyone? I'm Robert Adut from yaymath.org. I've been a math educator for 41% of my life. These are the facts. And to those of you who know me, you know I believe in the deep importance of connecting to students on a human level, that we can teach them math or any other subject and inspire them at the same time. Now, all of us want to improve at our game, myself included. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have thought leaders and experts from around the world come on a show where I can pick their brain and learn about what works for them. Let's level up and learn together. Thank you for joining us. This is Clear Conversations, sponsored by Carnegie Learning. And I'm very excited to host the kickoff episode of what purports to be a wonderful conversation with two wonderful guests that I'm going to introduce now. Jonathan Viner is a regular commentator, speaker, and writer on global ed tech trends, and is the founder of 10 Digits, a consultancy that works with entrepreneurs to build great brands and high growth businesses in the ed tech space. My next guest is Dr. Chip Kimball. Dr. Kimball currently serves as the director of the International School of Prague, where he's leading the school through one of the most significant seasons of change and improvement in its history. So that is an incredible uh, docket of guests. And let me, let me start with you, Jonathan. So you're a very prolific writer. I've read a lot of your stuff and preparing for this. And I just wanted to get an understanding and understand your mission. Why, why, what need do you see in the research and the writing that you, uh, that you put forth in, in trying to create this type of technological understanding, both for businesses, schools, and, and the industry at large? Okay. And firstly, Robert, thank you for having me on today. It's brilliant to be here and great to talk to you and, and Chip. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. I, I think there are two points I'd make in, in response to your question, both on a kind of very specific regional level and, and slightly more broadly. I think on a regional level, the Nordics, by which I mean um, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Iceland, uh, Norway, Sweden, Latvia, and Lithuania, I, I think are home to some of the um, most pedagogically and technologically advanced ed tech businesses um, anywhere. I think they're also um, really incredibly interesting in terms of some of the broader challenges that they're currently working through um, in terms of um, in terms of political change and in terms of the the kind of pushback, particularly in Sweden at the moment, back towards textbooks and away from digital learning. Now, some of that is perhaps a po post pandemic. The pendulum has swung too far. We're readjusting, but. I think there are some really interesting trends that are happening here. And my, I'm clearly not Swedish. I'm a, I'm a Brit, expat Brit living in Sweden. But part of my work and part of my mission around the newsletter is trying to bring that Nordic ed tech to, to a wider global audience. The, Nor the Nordic people are, are less forward, perhaps, in, uh, in promoting themselves and their work than, than other parts of the world. So shining a light on what's happening here is really important. But I think it's also, but more broadly, I think it's also about I'm trying to trying to raise awareness with educators of all shapes and sizes um, of good quality ed tech that's out there and to try and bring together um, educators to know what to look for when they are engaging in procurement exercises and to try and support ed tech companies to be better position themselves so that they can inform and communicate more clearly with educators about the reasons why their products are useful or valuable or engaging. So I, I think those are the two big things that that I try and do through my work, whether that's through the newsletter or, or whether that's through my consultancy projects that you mentioned. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because just listening to you, you know that over here in the US, every time we tout a uh, education system that seems to be working, it's in your part of the world. It's like, yeah, that's how they do it over there. And they, they value their teachers and they love educators and they, they give it such credibility and respect. And, and so having the, it's an interesting vantage point to actually be the person who influences the leaders who influence the teachers, right? As a classroom teacher for so many years, I'm very fascinated by that let's say pipeline, you know, and, and so I want to talk more about that pipeline with you in a moment. So I want to go to, to Chip now and same with you. I mean, look, listening to some of your interviews, <laughs> I confess I was like 10% about to send an application to the International School of Prague. I'm like, I'm going to go teach math for this guy, you know, because I've, I've had my share of leaders, um, you know, above me 
And I know a good leader when I see one. And you have this really fascinating vantage point. I mean, you're, you've been a CTO, a superintendent, a, a, and that route was very rare. That's an incredibly rare route. It's usually just, you know, just as said with, with respect, like teacher and then principal and then moving up. So you, you have a foot in so many of these different worlds. And then you go off to Singapore and now you're in Prague. And I'm curious about why, what, what is it? What's calling to you? What, what's the mission? What are you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling when you make these types of bold decisions to go overseas and, and be a leader of this sort? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. And, and also thank you again for facilitating this group. I'm really uh, loving uh, the opportunity to ch talk with Jonathan and thanks to Carnegie Learning for the sponsorship of this, of this group. Um, you know, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, when I think about that question of the why, um, for me, the why always lands with um, it's about kids. And so when I now open presentations, I open presentations, every presentation I do with a picture of my granddaughter, who's now seven weeks old, and that our obligation is to not be building the world for which we can be productive and happy and successful, but for a world where that six weeks old little girl um, can both um, be, enter a world uh, where um, she can both contribute and receive. And too often we are thinking about the immediacy of the problems rather than the future and how we're going to build a sustainable future for our kids. So it always stays, stays there. The other thing that's interesting about my career path and is we need people like Jonathan who are looking at mega trends, who are looking at these big, big themes inside and outside of cultures and countries. And we need people like me who are on the ground and implementing. Because there is this, there's this gap often between what a theorist might say and what a teacher can actually do. And my job is to take that theory, translate it into something that is implementable and execute. Because at the end of the day, again, if we're going to create this system for kids where they can thrive, um, we need to be able to make that translation. Now, the, the second part of your question is, well, why U.S., then Singapore, then, then Europe? Part of that, frankly, was authenticity is, uh, you know, I was standing on stages in front of hundreds, in some cases, thousands of people talking about the trends in China and India and all the things that maybe Jonathan was writing about. And I had never been to the likes of China or India. And maybe was I a fraud? Maybe was I actually speaking from a book and actually wasn't close enough to the ground to actually say for sure that my rhetoric was true. And so part of it was, frankly, an, an integrity test. Was my rhetoric matching the reality of what's going on in the world? And in some cases, it was. And actually, in some cases, it wasn't. And hence, my foray into the international world, where we can really begin looking at this from a global scale, not just a domestic U.S. scale. Yeah, that's an interesting. It's a field test on the grand <laughs> scale of your entire philosophy, your position, both as a as a teacher, faculty member, leader, and physically where your body is um, positioning yourself. So I want to I want to talk about that about the uh, influence. Let's say Jonathan, back to you. Um, so bear with me on this. All right. So when we had a leak in uh, the bathroom upstairs. My wife picked the tile, all right? And it was this very interesting mosaic of black and white tile, right? And at first she was hesitant. And I said, my response to her, I said, you should get this tile. And when it's installed you know, throughout the bathroom, you're gonna demonstrate to people that you know something that they don't know. You picked something, let's say, that people wouldn't necessarily pick because it's it was very, intricate, let's say, but together created this incredible display. And so I th thought of that with you. I, I think there's so much going on in your head that you know stuff that we don't know, right? Or there's people like us on the ground and you're, you're, you, f you come across a new technology or a new trend. You speak about it. You write about it. Wh what, what do you see ahead in the kaleidoscope that let's say 
a, a principal working hard in middle America or Australia or Japan, what, what do you see, let's say in terms of specific to technology, what's a trend that you, that you see that it's undeniable in your vantage point that you see coming ahead? What is it that you know that the rest of us don't know? Wow. Um, you're obviously far braver than I am, Robert, telling my wife that she should or shouldn't do something. That's that's not a path. That that's not a path that I've ever that I, <laughs> I, I just I've approved. Ever, I've ever trodden, I just approved, um, man. <laughs> I, I, I think um I think that what I would say is it is incredibly difficult from my vantage point to kind of the world has changed massively. What what I do three years ago, five years ago would have been I, I might well have come up with something that people hadn't, to answer your question, I might well have come up with something that nobody had ever heard of, but I genuinely don't. I, I think the world through social media has changed um, to the extent that teachers, educators of whatever, whether they're teaching in a primary school, whether they're teaching at university, I think are are actually at the forefront of these trends and are actually, um, I, it's very easy for me to pontificate and say, this is really important or that's really important, but they are hypothetical until somebody somebody like Chip actually picks them up and uses them in the classroom. They are just a trend. And, and I think we, we, get, um, we get wrapped up in technology and we get wrapped up in exciting things. But in reality, if it doesn't work in the classroom, then it is just a trend and it kind of evaporates like the South Sea bubble and we, we kind of move on to the next one. I think what I'm really interested in is how technology can deliver sustainable systemic change and those technology and trying to spot those technologies that are that are game changers that are going to be changing things in teachers' lives and in children's lives for the better this year, next year, and in five years' time, not those that are kind of going to disappear like the like yesterday's tide. I think it is therefore uh, you know at the moment the easy answer to your question is to talk about generative AI, it's to talk about chat GCP, it's to talk about that kind of thing. I'm actually, I think Chip used a word which, um, or referred to a, a world that I think actually is really strong here in the Nordics, which is around child focused. And I think it is those companies that can best deliver sustainable change for educators and for children, I think are those that put children at the center and educators at the center of what they're trying to do. And I think, um, in the Nordics, we see a lot in, in Sweden, in Estonia, in Finland of companies working with educators, working with schools um, to really try and um, develop the solutions that are right for the settings and that people will use rather than simply, here's a piece of cool kit, let's try and roll out and see what people think. And I think allied to that, the other big trend that I that I do see that I think is a really powerful trend is, is one around evidence. Can we prove can we as a school, can we as an educator, can we as an ed tech company, can we provide demonstrable evidence and share that evidence with others that ed tech initiative or product A, B, C actually works and actually does what it says on the tin? Because I think far too many don't. Um, so I, I, I'm, that's, what, that's a trend, whether it's in structure in the US buying learn platform, there are n numbers of other uh, uh, there's a company in the UK called Ed Tech Impact who do this kind of thing, but there are a number of these organisations who are building together and building communities of teachers and educators proving that these products work. And I think that's, un aside from generative AI, which I'm sure we'll get onto, I think being able to demonstrate that it works and sharing that with uh, with other community, with with a with other teachers is a really powerful trend that I think we'll see more of going forward. That's uh, also an interesting point. And just listening to you, uh, you have to know what is not a trend. It's you have to know the difference between the gold and the shiny rock, let's say. But, and that, that's part of what you're doing because it can lead us astray from actual results. It's really heartening to hear that everything that you're talking about has this child led and teacher led focus. How can we create a system or a structure or a technology that can impact a school, let's say tomorrow or next month or next school year? And and to know that that's the but direction I th I think it, from but your I think work it has to be and, I, and Chip would be far better place to me to say that teachers are incredibly busy they've got a million and one things to do they don't they don't have much time they don't have much money budgets are tight they don't have time to try fifteen different products and then say actually I think I like that one they need to quickly get to I need to buy a new math resource for this age group okay 
15 people have recommended this one. I'll take I'll take a free trial and test it. Whatever it is. I, they don't have time to try 15 things which don't work or to buy false marketing promises. I think it's really important that we that we focus on the, the companies focus on on that and the educators can choose those products that are right for them in their particular settings because what works here won't work necessarily there that's true yeah let's talk about that let's talk about that process of of you let's say you create or you discover or you vet or you report on and speak about a certain technology let's call it let's do chat gpt that's the big thing the the latest craze it's still somewhat in its infancy it's still a, a fun topic to discuss uh, in its genesis. And so, Dr. Kimball Chip, I've, I've been in these faculty meetings before. I, I know, I know the vibe where someone stands up and says, Hey, there's this incredible new thing that can help us in so many different ways. And then you have a stir in the room and some people say, great, bring it on. And some people all the way to the other end of the spectrum. I'm scared of it. I don't know what it is. I, I keep it away. I'm to fill in the blank, whether it be old school or they'll even say they're old and they'll just that, and use that as a reason, whatever, the, whatever, I've seen it all. So it's your job as a leader to vet the technology, your, your job as a leader to decide or help those around you decide whether or how to adopt, let's say, chat GPT that can help create a lesson plan or all these other, what, What's your process? I'm specific, I'm really curious about your process. How you do that? Um, what what goes through your mind and decision decisions you make and how that unfolds for you? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and you know it really comes down to the art and science of change. Um, and 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 change is not about technology. Change is about people, uh, because ultimately, regardless of the technology, and you can call a pencil a technology or a computer a technology, any new technology, any new to a system requires um, people to be able to implement that change. So often, often what we are um, often thinking about is what kind of screens do we use, even, even to figure out what to bring to our faculty. So one question that we're often asking is, um, what's the impact on learning and how do we know that it's it, it impacted learning? Are there case studies out there? Is there research out there? How, 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 how do we know? The second question is, uh, is it implementable? Uh, what is the effort that it takes in order to implement something? And the further away you depart from current practice, the more investment you need to make in making that change. The more professional development, the more investment of dollars of resources, the more investment of time. So the further your departure. So is it implementable? Is it scalable? If we do this, but it's only uh, uh, going to work for um, a percentage of your students, is that okay or is that not okay? And once you start working through a number of those big questions, like affordability, which Jonathan mentioned, then those are that's when you say, okay, I believe this actually has potential. Then you bring it to your faculty, and, and a very typical strategy is you look for early adopters. It does not mean that the whole system needs to commit. You try and understand the nuances of what the obstacles and opportunities are with any given implementation. And again, keeping students at the course, keeping practice at the core, and then begin to work towards, it, again, answering those questions. Is this a scalable model that is actually implementable inside of our system? Too often, again, we move from the ideal and forget about the practical. And there is an art and science to the teaching practice. Often what we do is we're focusing on the technology that will solve the science part of the practice, and we forget about the art of being a teacher. It's that relationship that's developed with a student. It's the nuance of how you collaborate with a colleague. It's writing that little element in your curriculum that provides a hook for a kid that gets them hooked on your topic for life. Those are the things that we forget to, to actually include in the conversations. And that's what frustrates teachers. So, and, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't ignore these, the, these technologies, which I'm a big advocate. I've, I've implemented many, many technologies over the years, but we have to keep these things in mind. The other thing that I think is interesting is Jonathan was talking a little bit about 
uh, the technologies that are emerging. You also need to think about, is it a technology that is custom built for our industry or is it a technology that is happening to us? So if we use interactive whiteboards as an example, those were predominantly um, uh, produced for the education market after some, some trialing in the business marketplace. But social media, social media happened to us. Social media was not built for the education space. And we have to know how to respond to that. And, and chat GPT and generative AI fits in that same category. Like it or not, this phase, this, the, this wave is a coming and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it, whether we like it or not. And those are the realities of schools. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, that I love it. it you can't, people misthink that leadership is, I know what can be best for us, even if it's hard and give you some tough love and kicking and screaming until the finish line. But you instead reframe it as a, a series of questions. And I love, I'm taking that. Is it happening for us or is it happening to us? That's just great. That's, that's a, such a good, if that's one of, let's say, 10 key questions. That, that to me is leadership in a nutshell. That's fantastic. Uh, Jonathan, um, I have a, I, I could go two different directions with you um, and you please take either one. And I'm gonna do this with uh, both of you. And then from there, feel free to engage each other uh, with regards to this. So I have two ideas. One of them is called the high five moment of the day. I once had a chance to talk to Elon Musk and ask him what his high five moment of the day was. And he said, uh, uh, I went to the Super Bowl. That was cool. So that was Elon for you. Um, but I really wanted to know what his high five moment of the day, his week, his month. You know, what what is a high five moment in your let's a, a typical let's say season or or quarter or month or week? That would be one question you could take. Another one is called the spontaneous soapbox. So if you had a you got on the soapbox and and you had the ear of industry leaders. Uh, teachers, uh, administrators, uh, anyone in the game that is like Chip wanting to create sustaining change for the betterment of, of schools. I mean, you've, you've traveled, you've written, um, you've, you, you've done, you've done the work. So what would be your message on your spontaneous soapbox? Either one of those, I'm, I'm very curious to hear, uh, where, where you, where you go with this. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm going to try and answer the second one and, and link it back to what Chip had said. And, and, and I think for me, um, it is around, Chip makes an incredibly useful distinction, which I will be borrowing as well. And, and I think what I see are, there, there seems to be there's an understandable confusion about chat GTP. And I think it is it and AI are being bundled together in, there's a whole lot of terms that are being kind of mangled together in a, in a big bucket, which, which makes the debate, I think, quite difficult to have. But I think at the heart, I... I would echo Chip's point, and I think what I am seeing, what I, I'm encouraged about, is to take to to extend it to the next stage. Is that there are there are lots of companies who are using it as a plugging. They're using it as an API. They're using it as a tool to enhance their solutions and to create purpose built education products. Whether that is um, an LMS that is then able to provide lesson plans, whether they are teacher community-led tools that enable teachers to pull stuff together. Uh, that is what excites me, I, I think, about generative AI. And I, I don't think it's necessarily the tool itself, whether we're talking about chat GP, GPT or, or whatever, is it is a tool. I think what's much more exciting for me is how it can add to existing products and resources or create new products that are purpose-built for education and for educators. That That's what excites me because I think otherwise we we risk we risk kind of falling down a rabbit hole where we're not quite sure what we're doing and we're not really sure that we're creating we're not creating stuff that is relevant the other on the other hand what does excite me uh, about the tools themselves is when teachers get hold of them when teachers use them to create um whether it's assessment frameworks or resources or materials that they can use i think i think that is exciting for me but i i think and I think there to, to answer your other point around realism and and kind of talking to opinion formers, I think suggesting that you know, Italy or U.S. states or U.S. institutions or wherever it might be have kind of closed it down and said we're not using this. I, that just strikes me as the most harebrained move I've I've ever heard. Um, and I think 
Um, should we tread carefully? Yes, of course. Should we? And, and I note that Elon is one of the voices kind of arguing for we should have a six month moratorium about whether we continue to invest in uh, in generative AI. But the genie is out of the bottle, and I think trying to put it back is is wrong. And trying to say to schools or to teachers or to kids that you can't use it is kind of a massively retrograde step. So I guess my my thing I would say is let's teach let's teach teachers let's teach kids to use them and to get the benefit out of them in a safe and measured way let's not have a free-for-all and let's not kind of try and put the genie back in the bottle and pretend it didn't exist that that's just burying your head in the sand territory which which doesn't seem to add much value to anybody in my opinion yeah I really appreciate that you're taking a stand on that in such an early phase I really do I think a lot of people need to hear that want to hear that I, I think there's a fear of the unknown and the fact that you're being very clear about where it's going and its potential and its use as a tool. It's not a panacea. It, it's a tool that can be implemented in a way to best create outcomes, not just swallowed wholesale. I think that's really important to say. And being on the ground, uh, I would support Jonathan's comments um, uh, significantly. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, banning, outlawing, uh, I, I, whatever, um, the use of, uh, of generative AI tools and chat GPT in particular uh, is misguided and naive. Um, <clears throat> I think more importantly is that we embrace it, understand it. And then underneath that, the question is, how are we encouraging students to use those higher order skills that we're hoping to teach that every 21st century skill framework talks about communication, collaboration, com cr uh, critical thinking, creativity? How are we actually teaching those skills through generative AI tools underlying with an ethos of ethics? So when you start creating those conversations around ethics, and are we using this as an opportunity to have an ethical conversation with kids about what's cheating and what's not cheating, what's fair and what's not fair, and how do you demonstrate your learning in a meaningful way if suddenly there are new tools that can actually capture different kinds of learning in, in new ways? Those are the questions that we should be asking. And Excuse me for being blunt, but shame on schools who, who, who are not asking those questions. I think just to build on to its point, if we look into higher education, what do we see? What is the demand from employers? What is the demand from students? They're looking for skills. They're looking for courses that get them work ready, that get them ready for the workplace and the environment. To Chip's point, if we aren't preparing children for a future in which AI tools are a given, then we are fundamentally failing to prepare them for the future, which is whether we're teaching them maths, whether we're teaching them geography, whatever we're teaching them, we need to teach them to prepare them for the future. And if we're not doing that, then I think fundamentally the ed tech ecosystem, whether that's teachers, whether that's schools, whether that's suppliers and providers are, are fundamentally failing the audience that we're ultimately profess and say that we're we're most interested in helping, which, which, which seems crazy. You know, if I hearken back to uh, in the United States, A Nation at Risk, which was published in 1981, since a nation at risk in 1981, we have been systematically teacher bash bashing for more than 40 years. And the problem in education, public and private, international and domestic, is that we have a talent pipeline problem. And the reason that we have a talent pipeline problem is because no longer is it, is it attractive or interesting to become a teacher because we have now built a society where teaching Teacher bashing is fair game. And so my soapbox would be that we have got to begin building an ethos collectively as a, as a country or as a global community where becoming a teacher is a wonderful, beautiful thing where you can make a difference in kids' lives and you are appreciated, not necessarily making tons and tons of money, where you are appreciated for what it is what it is you do and the difference you're making. If we look at motivational theory from the likes of Daniel Pink and others, teachers are looking for purpose, autonomy, and significance. There are ways to motivate people into the industry so that we get the best and brightest doing this, doing this really important work. And we aren't getting the talent anymore because nobody wants to come play. They want to go and 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 they'll 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 become a lawyer or a doctor or maybe even you know, go into banking rather than becoming a teacher. 
And that is a problem we need to fix. There was a brilliant, just to add, I would echo Chip's point entirely. There was a brilliant line in a Nordic newspaper a few months ago that said there's only one audience that has more people on the sidelines throwing stuff and comments at them than teachers, and that's football players. I thought it was, uh, it's a, it's my favorite quote of the year, but I, I think it, it rings true, and I, I would echo and support Chip entirely in that. And before we wrap up, uh, Chip, I'm wondering if you have any sort of resources or go-to piece of literature or any anything that you turn to in terms for guidance or inspiration uh, currently for you. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think the kind of reading that I often do, I actually look at three or four different genres. The first is I look at things that are coming out in the business world. So a, a lot of the books around business leadership, how do you lead change? You know, everything from uh, John Cotter to to others around change and how you lead those change, whether it's a business or a not-for-profit or a school or a church, many of the themes are the same. The second genre is in the psychology um, realm. So everything, and, and that applies to things that come out of positive psychology, like the strengths work that Gallup did for many years. Uh, to more of the more emerging work, everything from the the power of regret, which was was just recently published. So the psychology work is an area that I go to. Uh, then I also go to the um, uh, the work around education. So education thought leaders. Uh, Solution Tree is a good example. Everything from PLCs to um, uh, to um, uh, responsive uh, responsive classrooms uh, to um, what we're doing with kids with learning needs. Those are places that I go. So I try and actually sample from multiple areas because it's actually a well-rounded view of what we should be thinking about. Because education at the end of the day is not just about what kids are learning, but it's the developing of these humans into people. So what's the world they're looking in that they're going to be entering vis-a-vis -vis business? What's the psychology you need in order to think about the full development of a child? And then what are the practices in the classroom today that we should be supporting and championing so that our teachers can do the best job possible? So th those are the genres I tend to look at. Thank you. Thanks for that. And Jonathan, what about you? What, what type of uh, information or literature or inspiration do you uh, gain from? Uh, I, I, Chip has given me some excellent things to add to my reading list there. I guess as a producer of a newsletter, um, I spend most of my time rooting around strange, bizarre education and ed tech newsletters and publications published by um, media outlets in, in the territories that I work in and, and beyond. Um, I guess there are some obvious ones, whether that's uh, ed tech insiders, um, the ed tech podcast, um, whether that's the work, so the Times Educational Supplement in the UK, um, the work of, uh, of Ed Surge in the US, I think are incredibly useful. Um, I think more broadly for me, looking at some of the trends that I try and kind of follow people like Colin IQ produce um, a raft of really interesting market insight and market intelligence work. And, and we've spoken a lot about schools inevitably given um, given Chip's background, but I think lots of the most exciting work in EdTech it, it, at the moment is taking place on a corporate learning, um, on a corporate learning perspective. And, and there is lots of fascinating work from uh, being published by people that you'd expect like Udemy, like Coursera, like LinkedIn, um, so quite quite a lot that, that kind of future of work uh, and future of learning and, and the skills that children leave university or leave school with, I, I think is a fascinating area that we don't talk enough in, in ed tech. And, and my wife would kill me if I didn't mention the high performance podcast as well, which she listens to religiously and which um, lots of teachers and lots of schools listen to as well. So yeah, I hope that's a, I hope that's a useful summary. And clearly, I, I should summary. be yeah. uh, I should be having Jonathan <laughs> at, reading Jonathan at the top of my list. So forgive me, Jonathan, but you are now oh, at the top of my Jim, reading list. Kind. So I just want to thank my guest, Jonathan Viner and Dr. Chip Kimball. Uh, if you're interested in following their work, please check out the description for all the information uh, about them. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you both for joining us. I just want to thank say thank you again. Thank you again. Absolute pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Robert Adu from Clear Conversations, sponsored by Carnegie Learning, and we'll see you next time.